Good evening, everyone. My name is Father Jim Wayner. I know that Father Nick has just introduced me. Welcome to Notre Dame Seminary. I wish I could be at this Homegrown Harvest Gala fundraiser. Uh, it would be a great opportunity to meet so many of you. I'm very grateful to Bishop Kopass, who not only supports Notre Dame Seminary here in New Orleans, he also serves on the Board of Trustees and oversees one of our committees that directly supervises the priestly formation program. This is my ninth year here uh, at Notre Dame Seminary. As Father Nick had introduced me, I'm a priest from the Diocese of Pittsburgh. I gotta tell you, when I first came here to the South, to New Orleans, me being a Steelers fan, I had to ad adapt the black and gold of Pittsburgh to the black and gold of New Orleans Saints, but I feel very much at home here. And the Jackson Seminarians who have gone through here, so many now are your priests. I really have had a chance to get to know Mississippi and the Diocese of Jackson, and I know those priests are working hard and serving you well. So I wanted to share with you all a reflection on how do we do priestly formation today in the 21st century. The year 2020 has been an extraordinary year. Uh, from hurricanes down here at least, certainly the pandemic, people losing their jobs, uh, the stresses that are seen in, in family life these days, uh, the political turmoil that we've seen this past year, uh, the social unrest our nation has seen. Where does the Catholic Church have a voice in all of this? Uh, what do you expect of your priests uh, as shepherds of the church? Uh, with the unique challenges that might be in your diocese in Jackson, and the great opportunities to be a Catholic uh, in this 21st century. What do you expect of your priests? The formation team here in New Orleans, we're, we're serving over 20 dioceses. So we've got seminarians from Texas, uh, certainly Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, up to Nashville, all, all over to Raleigh, uh, throughout Georgia, both of those dioceses. So when all the men come here, and we have 150 seminarians uh, here at Notre Dame Seminary, we have to be able to see, okay, who are these men? Where are they coming from? And what's the best way to form them so that when they go back to the diocese, back to Jackson, that they have a, a realistic understanding of what it means to be a shepherd today, and at the same time, to be faithful. What is the church asking them? How are they supposed to be preaching the gospel? And what are you expecting of them? So the seminary is charged with pulling all of these expectations together and then forming the seminarian. This is our 100th anniversary soon to be. Uh, it was 1923 when we opened. And as I mentioned, we have 150 seminarians. It's actually the largest enrollment in the entire history of Notre Dame Seminary. So praise God uh, that the Lord continues to call men forward to come and discern a priestly vocation. Now, just a quick uh, uh, summary on how the seminarian, uh, where he goes and how he's formed. There are seminarians who come right out of high school. They typically go to a place like St. Joseph Seminary that's also here in New Orleans that is a college seminary. So those men, uh, from an academic standpoint, are pursuing an undergraduate degree. Most of the courses are philosophy, humanities, liberal arts, but at that phase of formation, they're really exploring what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, and in that discipleship, the question is raised, are you called to be a priest, okay? So those are college seminarians. Then there are seminarians who already went to college. They're called pre-theology seminarians. They come in, like your vocation director, Father Nick uh, went through this experience, you go through two years of, of philosophy as well to get them ready for graduate studies. Uh, that's the master's level. So in those two years, we're asking the same question. What does it mean to be a discipleship? Those seminarians have already had some life experience. Uh, they have a, a human formation that's been cultivated. That's why their program is typically two years. So once the men complete either the two-year program, pre-theology, or the four years of undergraduate, then they come here to Notre Dame Seminary. This is the graduate level. They're pursuing a master's degree in theology. And at this stage, they're beginning to wear the collar. And the question of celibacy, 
Obedience, those become very particular questions that the seminarians have to discern uh, with us as a formation team to ask the question, is God calling you to a lifelong commitment uh, to be a diocesan priest? So that's really what our mission at Notre Dame Seminary, to work with those men at the final stages of their formation. But as I mentioned, this all takes place in real time. You know, as, as Catholics and Christians, we celebrate the fact that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and dwelt among us. How does the church incarnate herself, as the Word was incarnated, into everyday life? Let's, if you think about it, the political situation 2,000 years ago was Caesar Augustus. Rome was occupying this part of the Middle East where Our Lady was about to give birth to her child. In the middle of this political situation, Joseph has to take this family, his pregnant wife, to Bethlehem because there was a political decision by Caesar Augustus to take a census. Why couldn't the Lord wait one more year, for example, so that this family would not be disrupted? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us in very real political situations in very real economic situations, there was no room at the end, uh, as well as uh, a sense of spiritual, not crisis, but a spiritual challenge that was being left to this family to be faithful in all of these different circumstances. So the seminary exists in real time and real space, so the men have to really discern their vocation in the context of the political, the economic, and the social realities, because that's where the church needs to bring her voice. Uh, thinking here of um, 1978, uh, Pope John Paul II was just elected Pope. His first homily, St. Peter's Square, 1978, uh, it was in October, and uh, his first homily, he said, we're going to bring the Catholic Church into every economic, political sphere, and do not be afraid. He already knew that he was going to bring the church into the 21st century, the great jubilee, the year 2000. From 1978 until to the year 2000, we saw the Pope exercising a ministry, and most of you would remember this, uh, where he was bringing the church into these situations. Communism collapsed, partly due to his ministry. So I, that's the question today. Where is the voice of the Catholic Church in today's situations? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I want to share with you, uh, it's one of Pope Benedict's favorite stories. It's a theological story. It was actually told by this philosopher called Kierkegaard. It's a very simple story, but it's something that I use when the new seminarians come here. Uh, they come here in August. We go through a week of orientation, and I always use this story to help them understand their own role in formation. They're the chief protagonist. They have to be in charge of what God is doing with them and for them. Here's the story. The circus comes into town on the outer skirts of this village. And the circus is setting up its tents for the evening performance and everyone's getting ready. The whole town is excited that the circus uh, is in town. A fire breaks out near the circus and the manager dispatches the two fastest people that can get into the village to warn the people that if we get together now we can stop the fire and we can proceed with the evening performance so he sends the two fastest people into the village they already were dressed for the evening performance they were clowns the two fastest people were these clowns. They get into the village square, they get everybody's attention, and they said, look, a fire has broken out, it's working its way towards the village. Let's work together and we'll put this fire out and we'll be able to continue with the, the evening celebration. Well, everyone just stood there. And these clowns are getting more animated with, with this uh, announcement. The people start clapping. They think this is a, a commercial for the evening performance. And the clowns are even more intentional about what's happening. Well, the fire came and it burned on the whole village. 
Why couldn't the villagers simply respond to what was being told to them, announced to them? Because the message was coming off of the lips of two clowns. I think sometimes uh, as Catholics, we might feel like clowns because what we're saying is real, it's true, it's beautiful, it's our faith, and nobody wants to listen. As priests, you know, we wear the collar, the vestments, sometimes the seminarians might feel like clowns in their own families uh, with friends that they have because the credibility of the church has been challenged from time to time. Uh, sometimes the fidelity of the clergy has been undermined by the clergy themselves. So for the seminarian to be trained and formed to be a voice of the gospel and the voice of Christ and to be faithful to that gospel, recognizing that the world might laugh at them, the world might ignore them, sometimes the world listens. And you've all been in that situation, right? Think of maybe it's your Thanksgiving meal, Christmas gathering, Mardi Gras down here at least. So everyone comes together and how often you might say, nobody talk about religion. Nobody talk about this particular issue because it's only going to create attention. And sometimes that's the right decision to make. But do we Catholics sometimes remain silent when all of these different things are happening in our world? We make the profession that we're one nation under God. So as Catholics, who are Americans, as priests, you know, as, as Christian men who are part of this world, we have something to be able to say. So I, I use this story uh, at the beginning of the priestly formation experience of a new seminary to help him understand realistically Christ was laughed at, Christ was mocked, Christ changed people's lives when people allowed this. And so we have to have a, a really good understanding of what it means to be a shepherd today. Now I, I cited two popes right there, and I want to also cite Pope Francis as well. Let me tell you how we're trying to to form our guys here at Notre Dame Seminary. It's to be good, faithful shepherds in three different ways. Uh, Pope Francis said this not long ago, that we need priests who are in front of the flock, who are in the middle of the flock, and who are behind the flock. So let me just break that down for you a little bit here. And this is important for us here at Notre Dame Seminary to be sure that when our guys leave here to go back to your diocese, that they can find themselves in these three different ways within the flock. Number one, in front of the flock, what do you expect to see in your priests? What do you expect to see in them? They have to be in front of the flock. We're not superheroes, okay? Uh, although St. Paul says we must be all things to all people. But when he's standing in front of the flock, now, we train our guys very well here theologically. They get a solid theological formation. But that doesn't mean they're going to be a good leader. They have to know how to lead. That requires a human formation. That requires a deep spiritual formation. Certainly a solid intellectual theological formation. But most importantly, a pastoral formation. And that's why sometimes it takes a few years for a newly ordained priest to understand what type of a leader am I? So that when he's in front of the flock, and this is not about him, this is about leading people to Jesus Christ, that he can gather the flock together and that you can trust him and that we can all follow Christ together. So the seminary needs to understand what does this look like? He can't be fake. This is not a popularity contest. Uh, this is not always being liked. But he needs to love the flock and they need to trust him. So our formation program here helps prepare the men to understand what that means out front. Secondly, and you may have heard this, this was years ago, uh, not long after he became our Pope, Pope Francis, uh, the jingle was to smell like the sheep, okay? He wants his priests to be in the middle of the flock. Do you know them? Do you know their cares, their concerns, their joys, their anxieties? Uh, what are the tensions of this past year, for example? What has the pandemic uh, done for all of you? 
we had 50 seminarians that stayed here for this past summer because they couldn't go home, they didn't have assignments. And we brought people in very carefully with masks, social distancing. And the first one, we brought married couples in who just got married this past year with a team of them. And they shared with us, this is what family life has looked like for the past few months. And it was really, that was very helpful for us to understand. Uh, some of them, two of the couples were pregnant. One had already a newborn baby. And of course, none of this was expected, this pandemic. They, they were not anticipating, this is what the first year of our marriage is gonna look like. That's just an example of how we try to keep it very real here at Notre Dame Seminary. Uh, and when the guys are home, back in the Diocese of Jackson, when the bishop and Father Nick assigned the guys into parishes, we want them to understand you, your realities, your struggles, so that when we're preaching, when we're administering the sacraments, when we're teaching, that this isn't just simply an academic exercise, that it's gonna to touch your lives, it's gonna to touch the sensitivities that you're going through, that it's gonna to touch your suffering. Now, let me just quickly, uh, this is a, uh, one of my favorite gospel passages, and uh, let me just read through it. It's from Luke chapter seven, and this is about authority. This is how Christ entered into the, the sheep in this particular pastoral experience, and with some authority, with some knowledge, with some discernment, uh, was able to provide ministry. And this is what we want for our seminarians. So let me read this to you. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town, and his disciples and a large crowd accompanied him. As he approached the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of a widowed mother. A considerable crowd of townsfolk were with her. The Lord was moved with pity for her, and he said, Do not cry. Then he stepped forward and touched the coffin. At this the bearers halted. He said, Young man, I bid you to get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Then Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear seized them all, but they praised and glorified God. I got to tell you, we're not training our seminarians or the priest of Jackson to bring the dead back to life, okay? So uh, that's not necessarily what our formation program is about here. But just, to, just imagine what you just heard here. There's a whole crowd following Jesus. There's a whole crowd, a funeral procession. Both of these are coming into one another. Jesus sees what's happening. He's moved with pity, a real pastoral sensitivity. And with discernment, he enters into this moment. And he touches the coffin. He touches this darkness. He touches this grief. He touches this suffering. He's going to be a part of it. He's not a spectator. Pope Francis addressed the seminarians a couple years ago and said, I want a priesthood that's black and blue, meaning I want it to get in the street. If you stand in the street, you might get hit by a car. That's where I want my priests, in the middle of it. And you're going to get bruised. They're going to get beat up. What he said was, I don't want a priesthood that's on the sidewalk watching life go by. So here it is, there's this procession going by. Now Christ with pastoral discernment, you know, re with responsibility, is gonna enter into the darkness of this grieving widow. She's a widow, you caught that, she's already lost her husband. Now she loses her son, it's her only son. Just imagine the grief. And who is he to step into this and touch the casket? Then, as we heard amazingly, the, the dead man comes back. Then with authority, he gives him back to her. Now, again, a lot of this is anecdotal to the way in which we want to form our priest here at Notre Dame Seminary, to go back to your diocese in Jackson, to responsibly enter into the darkness of people. There's a lot of darkness going on. The church isn't going to judge the darkness. The church wants to enter into it, you know. And uh, it's very easy for us priests to identify the darkness and maybe sometimes to judge it. And uh, you, you all know that Pope Francis, there's room for that. 
But the Holy Father wants us to get into it, to smell like the sheep, to be a part of people's lives. And that's a particular charism for us diocesan priests. We take on your spirituality as spiritual fathers. We're not going to be spectators of your life. We want to become a part of it in a responsible way. And that's why there's a collaboration that occurs between lay people and priests so that we priests understand responsibly and that you all can let us in, to let the church in, to let her ministry in. So that's the second element of, of a good shepherd, a, a priest who's out front, a good leader, that's the first aspect. Secondly, he's in the middle of the flock, but then thirdly, he's behind the flock, that nobody gets left behind. And I think today in the world, we've got a lot of people that feel left behind. They feel isolated. They feel judged. And uh, the church wants to be sure that everybody has access uh, to this gospel, that everybody is able to hear and experience Jesus. Now, I'm not going to read through this next passage. This is now coming from Luke chapter 8. But let me just summarize the, this, this situation here. Jesus is on his way to a guard whose daughter is suffering. On the way there, another crowd has erupted here, and there's a hemorrhaging woman on the ground. And as they're pressing through the crowds, the disciples are with him, she reaches up and is able to touch his tassel. And he stops and said, somebody just touched me. And the disciples said, Lord, uh, we're in the middle of a Mardi Gras parade, so to speak. We're in the middle of this crowd. Everybody's touching us. No, no, no. Somebody just touched me with faith. And once he was able to see what was going on, the hemorrhaging woman was healed by simply touching him. See, the Lord, th through the whole mystery of the church, but in a particular way through priestly life and ministry, wants you and I to have access to him, to touch him, to taste him, to hear him. That's what he wants for us. That's why in theology, the priest is described as the altar Christus, meaning he's the other Christ. He becomes Christ in that moment of baptizing the baby, hearing your confessions, confecting the Eucharist, bringing the sacraments to the sick. People have an access to the Lord. So a part of what we're doing here at Notre Dame Seminary is how can the priest be a pathway to Christ? You know, this was a part of the preaching of, of uh, St. John the Baptist. Make straight the paths to the Lord. It's not create barriers, obstacles. This is not a game. How can the church open up pathways so that people can hear him, see him, and embrace him? So behind the flock, the shepherd who are seeing the people who are isolated, who are marginalized, uh, who have no one to be with them. Let me share this with you. What is the oldest, oldest image of Christ? Thus far from the catacombs, it's not a crucifix. The oldest image of Christ is the good shepherd. It's a young man with a sheep over his shoulders. You, you remember the parable, right? Where the Lord says, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after that one. It's interesting, that's what the Christians of the early church and their memory and their mind, that's what's depicted in the catacombs in Rome. That's the oldest image of Christ. A good shepherd who's got that sheep. He's found the lost sheep. And that's what the Christians, that's how they were understanding themselves because they were being persecuted. They were being killed of the, because of their choice to follow the gospel. Well, in this 21st century, there are people that don't even know who the gospel is, who Christ is, and they're marginalized. They're, they're living lives that, uh, that God never wanted them to have. And so we're preparing our guys to keep their eyes open for this. Yes, the, the practicing Catholics need to be supported and catechized, and, uh, but so often priests will put a lot of energy into our practicing Catholics, as it should be, but what about the non-practicing? The people who are angry with the church, the people in the neighborhoods that live around the church who aren't even baptized. They don't even know what it means to be a Christian. So this is the formation that our guys are, are getting here at Notre Dame Seminary. 
That's an aspect of being a good shepherd. Now, as I'm moving through here, uh, as I soon begin wrapping this all up here, I, I wanted to just give you all a practical sense of how formation works at Notre Dame Seminary in this 21st century. And it's around the concept of evangelization, okay? Our popes have been using this word uh, really since the Second Vatican Council. John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis. And I want to just summarize how each of them use it because that's what inspires the formation program here at Notre Dame Seminary. It gives it flavor, it gives it direction, it gives it purpose. Let me start with uh, John Paul II. He was using this evangelization or this new evangelization around the gospel passage, and you can remember this, Peter is fishing all night long. He's not catching anything. The sun's coming up, and they're beginning to wrap up their fishing nets. And the Lord says, oh, excuse me, Peter, you need to go deeper out, and you'll catch a lot of fish. Now, I'm not a fisherman. I, I fish at the local grocery store. That's the, the furthest I've ever gone fishing. But a fisherman, these are 200-pound nets. They're casting these nets all night long. They're, not, they're exhausted. They're tired. They haven't caught in anything. And here's the Lord saying, you know, very confidently, uh, no, unfold those nets, go back out, but go deeper into the waters. In Latin, this is called dulc and arutum, which means going deeper into the waters. And he says, Peter, you're going to catch more than fish. You're going to catch souls. That's what I'm going to do with your ministry. So, how far can we go into the waters of life to catch souls? There, uh, as he tells Peter, do not be afraid. Go deeper and deeper and deeper into people's lives, into the lives of our society and our culture. We talk about that here at Notre Dame Seminary. Uh, again, responsibly, but as Pope Francis says, we don't want sacristy priests, the priest who just stays in his rectory all day in the sacristy all day. It begins there, it begins at Mass, then we're sent forth, and then we'll come back to Mass again. And I, I can tell you that today's seminarian is very much caught in that zeal. Our, our young men today, they are on fire, they want to be out there. Now we're trying to shape and form that zeal so that it's done responsibly, but I can tell you all, uh, the men that are being ordained, and, and you can look at the guys who've been ordained in recent years, uh, that theological mindset is what's framing their understanding of mission, okay? Do not be afraid, go deeper into the waters. Now, for Pope Benedict, uh, he took that same concept, and do you remember the story in the gospel where the Lord throws a fit? So he uh, overturns the, the tables and the money changers, and, and uh, he admonishes them all because they were using a section of this temple that was not meant for money changers. Actually, what they were doing, there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. It was in the wrong place. Now, the temple in Jerusalem is the most imposing structure. This was at the time of Christ. And at that time, this became the crossroads of the Middle East. Everybody passed through Jerusalem. Then there's this huge temple Outside of the temple are a series of courtyards, okay? And some of these courtyards, in fact, there were things being sold that for sacrifices, and, um, you know, it was the gift shop. All of these things were there. But there was a courtyard that was called Courtyard of the Gentiles. This is where non-Jews could have an experience of the temple priests and ask questions. That courtyard was being occupied by these money changers. And the Lord wants that cleared out. Pope Benedict takes that image to say, you know, we Christians clutter. We can clutter our lives in such a way that the Christian faith is not radiant. It's not fresh. It's not bold. So at the seminary here, we talk about what does the seminarian need to clear out? That his celibacy is faithful. His obedience is faithful. How do we make space for the Lord? How do we clear that out? How do we let the Lord into our darkness? How do we say, I need you here. This got cluttered. This is dirty. This is filthy. 
We need you here. Now, for the seminarian to be a faithful shepherd, he's got to do that. So let me explain to you what we do here at the seminary. Every seminarian has two priests. One priest is his spiritual director. That's the internal form. It's like going to confession. This is where the seminarian has to open himself up and completely, uh, with his spiritual director, understand this is where the devil has me. This is my demons. These are my sins. How can they be purified? How can he be converted closer to Christ? The other priest, this is called the external form, this is the priest who has the standards and the thresholds that you expect, that the church expects, and we have to challenge the seminary to be able to live up to these thresholds. Now, this is not a cookie cutter operation. We've got seminarians here who are 22, 23 years old. I got seminarians who are 50 and 60. I've had seminarians uh, who have been in the military, seminarians fresh out of college. So it's like the apostles, right? We had Matthew who worked for the government as a tax collector. We have a young St. John who was 13, 14 years old. Peter owned his own business. Judas tried overthrowing the government. So they all came together. And it was in this diversity of backgrounds that the Lord was forming them. So the church has standards that no matter what age you are, this is what it means to be a priest, while at the same time respecting and acknowledging the uniqueness of every seminarian. So this idea of letting the Lord into your darkness, he has to be able to do that first so that when he, as your shepherd, is calling you to be a saint, calling you to be holy, that he's going to be able to direct you and shepherd you in such a way that we've, we've cleared out the courtyard to let the Lord in. So for Pope Benedict, that was sort of his understanding of evangelization. The Catholic Church is going to help the world, that the kingdom of God is here. We need to clear out everything that doesn't belong to God. Thirdly is Pope Francis. Now his very first encyclical, it was called Lumen Fidei, which means the light of faith. Similar to Pope Benedict, the Christian lights the world up. That when a Christian goes into the darkness, he brings the light of Christ. You've been to the Easter Vigil before. That's how we begin the Easter Vigil liturgy. We're all in darkness. The Easter candle is lit. And then that fire spreads uh, throughout the church from candle to candle. And then the whole church is lit up from the candlelight. Pope uh, Francis uses that as an image of the Catholic Church. If we can spread the fire of the gospel, the world can be ablaze with God's kingdom. And for us priests... And we're all in this together. We, we're, as, as Christians, we make up the body of Christ. But the priest has a particular responsibility as your spiritual father. So that's uh, after four to six years of formation at Notre Dame Seminary, that when the men are about to be ordained, they're not perfect. We talk about progress, not perfection. That they have now taken that gospel, they've put it on, they've put on Christ, and now they're ready to go into your diocese, into Jackson, and, and be able to serve you faithfully. But the men have come to understand that, like those circus clowns, uh, they have to be ready and prepared for the realities that you confront every single day. And they need to be able to understand that when the gospel is preached, they have to do it uh, with zeal and fidelity. I'm going to conclude with uh, the Blessed Mother. Why her life and her spirituality is adopted by the priest. Now, there, there's what's called the Code of Canon Law. This is uh, a code of all the laws of the church, uh, and the guys have to come to understand all of them. There's only two saints that's listed in that book. One is St. Thomas Aquinas, and it's about how we should learn philosophy and theology. And the other is the Blessed Mother. You cannot be a priest unless you understand your sonship with her. You must have a devotion to her. Why? Because as the early church fathers describe her, she's the first human tabernacle. Okay, so you remember in the Gospels where Elizabeth, her cousin, is pregnant, and Our Lady has just learned that with the Annunciation that she herself now is pregnant. In the Gospel of Luke, she, as she's pregnant. She goes in haste. She didn't take an Uber. Uh, she didn't you know, take some day trips. She went in haste with her own feet to her cousin. 
Some of the early church fathers describe this as the beginnings of a Eucharistic grace. So she's carrying Christ, the body and blood, and for pregnant women, understanding how your blood and the baby's blood are intermingled here uh, in that pregnancy, that she now, and her blood and Jesus' blood are inter intermingled, and she's going in haste, on mission, to bring Christ, to bring herself into the situation where her cousin is very elderly, but was given the great gift of life with pregnancy. And do you remember when they first see each other, and after Elizabeth responds with great faith to her cousin uh, Mary, Mary responds, my soul magnifies the greatness of the Lord. Now she's quoting from uh, the Old Testament there, but she takes that as her own. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My soul magnifies the greatness of the Lord. Every time we receive the Eucharist, for a moment, we have that same grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. We have that same grace. We were baptized into it. But when, when you and I receive the Eucharist, like her, our souls magnify the greatness of the Lord. So what does that mean for the life of a priest? You know, when he's celebrating Mass, there's a moment uh, after the collection's been taken and the gifts are prepared, the priest will say these words, let us now pray that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable. So the sacrifice of the priest and your sacrifice, they're, they're different. There's the one priesthood of Jesus. Your priesthood is being lived as a baptized person. Our priesthood, because we're ordained, is being lived in a particular way. And at that moment of the Mass, the priest is saying, let us now pray that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable in that moment right there. For Our Lady, as her soul is magnifying the greatness of the Lord, the priest who, with the words of institution, are going to bring about that Eucharist. And when he receives it, and when you receive it, we've now been charged, each in our own way, to magnify the greatness of the Lord. And so as the seminarian is discerning his vocation coming from a family, coming from somewhere in your diocese, he's coming from somewhere, he's on mission, as Our Lady went to Elizabeth, he's coming to the seminary. What is the Lord going to do with him and for him? Now, sometimes uh, uh, the guys come to a situation where they recognize they're not called to be priests. Good. Our job here is to get the guys out of the seminary, to get them into priesthood or to get them back into life. If they're faithful, if they have done everything asked of them, they're going to be good, holy Christian laymen. That's what the Lord wanted them to experience here at the seminary. And hopefully they'll be also very good priests. So our job here is they're on mission. When they bring their story, they bring their discipleship, they bring their background, they bring their sins, they bring their brokenness. That for these next years now, uh, as Mary was magnifying the greatness of the Lord, what does that look like at the seminary? And we become a real community. We're a real apostolic community, like those apostles were a community for three years before they were sent on mission. So in this house here, we get to know one another, we pray together, we play together, uh, we really get to know who we are, and it's in that relationship that as the guys are magnifying the greatness of the Lord, that they're exploring with Our Lady, their sons of Mary, uh, what their vocation is supposed to be. I would like to, uh, hopefully as we move into the future here, get to meet so many of you, uh, for my nine years here so far in New Orleans, I've had the opportunity, uh, obviously, to, to serve under your bishop, Bishop Kopass. Uh, Father Nick, your vocation director, was a seminarian here, and now to see him as the director of vocations and the excitement and the enthusiasm that he has for your diocese so that the young men of your diocese are able to at least understand what the priesthood is. You know, and at some point, every young man, you know, should, it should at least be uh, looked at. Am I called to be a priest? No, more often than not, they won't be, but the question should be asked. So I'd like to leave that challenge with you. Who are the young men in your parish that you see, maybe they're serving at the altar, you see them in prayer uh, uh, in your church. Have you ever said to one of them, hey, uh, have you ever thought about becoming a priest? Now, they may laugh at first, or they might, you know, what, what are you talking about? 
but don't be afraid to ask them. Uh, I, I think that's a, a part of your responsibility. Now, we priests, you know, especially the pastors, parochial vicars, now they're going to be able to see in their flock maybe, but sometimes it might be more uh, surprising, more authentic, that when a lay person is saying to a young man, I think, you know, I see some qualities in you that are consistent with priesthood. You should just think about it. That can go a long, long way. And I, I hope that you would have the influence, the courage to be able to reach out to your young men. But f great things are happening in Jackson. And I was very uh, pleased to offer these reflections. I was glad to have been invited and I would like to have seen you all at the gala. Uh, but right now, this is the best that we can do. And uh, let us pray that the Lord bless your bishop, your diocese, bless the efforts of priestly vocations and to bless Notre Dame Seminary, because that's where most of your men are now studying uh, here uh, as they prepare for priesthood. Why don't we end with a prayer, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dearest Heavenly Father, your word became flesh and continues to dwell among us in the life of the church. We ask your blessings upon the shepherd of our church in Jackson, Bishop Kopass, upon all of the clergy, upon our vocation efforts, upon Father Nick, upon all of us who've gathered for this gala, that you strengthen us with a conviction of faith, hope, and love to be able to manifest your kingdom in what we say and what we do. Lord, we also recognize the people who are hurting and suffering in our world and in our diocese, maybe family members and friends who no longer practice their faith, who struggle with their faith. We pray that by the gift of your spirit, by our own prayers, they may come back to your truth. Lord, we offer all of these prayers in faith through Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.